two, one. Well, greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. It's a beautiful fall day in upstate New York. We're very glad you could join us for our latest virtual Voices of the Game program. We're going to be talking to Alice Camps, the museum curator, National Archives Museum, about their brand new exhibit. It's an exhibit about sports in general, all American, the power of sports, but there are a number of baseball related artifacts and documents uh, that we will talk about during the course of about the next hour or so. Uh, for those of you who are new to our virtual programs, my name is Bruce Markison and I work in the uh, education department here at the Hall of Fame. I'm not a curator, but I do work in education and uh, host um, uh, these programs that we do. We have Hall of Famers on, former players, uh, experts from our staff and experts from other museums today. And we're very glad to have join us from Washington DC National Archives Museum, uh, curator Alice Camps. Alice, thank you very much for joining us. How are you today? I'm well, thank you so much for having me, Bruce. I'm thrilled to be here and share a little information about our exhibit. Well, we're excited as well. We want to give you some background information on Alice. Um, let me uh, recalibrate my PowerPoint here. Just a moment, please. Would you give me just one moment? All right, there we go. So. Some of Alice's many credentials shown here. Alice uh, has been the uh, curator at the National Archives since back in 2009. Prior to that, uh, she worked as an independent ex exhibition developer, 2003 to 08. Also director of programs at the uh, 10 Chimneys Foundation and has served as director of arts learning at Chicago Children's Museum. Um, as we get started, Alice, tell us about um, how you arrived at uh, the National Archives back in 09. Well, my husband and I relocated to Washington DC uh, for a position that he had. And um, I had been in the museum field for, as you can see, for a couple of decades by then and was looking for a, a job. And the National Archives position opened up and I was absolutely thrilled to um, be selected to, to be a curator for their museum. Well, certainly a prestigious uh, position and a prestigious museum. We're glad that um, um, your career has gone so well and you've done a nice job putting together this new exhibit, All American, The Power of Sports. It did open just a couple of weeks ago, uh, September 16th. It is a, a temporary exhibit, but it'll be up for all of next year. And then the first week of 2024. Alice, how did the idea for this exhibit come about? Uh, where did it start and um, where did you have to kind of pick up the ball from there? <laughs> Great question. I, I think it started with the realization that the National Archives has wonderful records about sports. Um, you know, the National Archives holds the records of the federal government, but people are sometimes surprised at the, the breadth and scope of those records, which really touch on all aspects of our lives. And so over the years, we've done various um, journal articles and blog posts and so forth about some of the wonderful sports records. And then we realized, you know, this would make a fantastic exhibit. So once we'd settled on sports, I picked it up from there and I started learning about how much sports was involved in the formation of our national identity and how the different powers of sports have been used by the United States throughout the years. And so the exhibit is, a, is divided into four sections that cover these different powers, if you will. Um, the first is the power to unite. And that photo on the right of President Bush is a good example of that. Um, the next is the power to teach. And uh, during the progressive era, sports were used a great deal to teach American values in the belief that they would help create good American citizens. Mm -hmm. We also look at the power of sports to promote a positive image of the United States around the world through the through Olympic and other international competitions. 
and through the use of athletes as diplomats in, in uh, foreign countries. And then finally, we look at the power that athletes have to break social, bar social barriers, gender, um, ethnic and racial barriers, and then finally to use their platforms to protest injustice. From the moment that the staff came up with the idea for this exhibit, mm -hmm. how long did it take to create and complete the exhibit? I know it was several years, but can you give us a more yes. precise timetable? Um, this one had a little bit longer runway than a typical exhibit because it was delayed by the pandemic. So it's been about four years since I started doing research on the project. So was it originally going to open in 2019 or 20? Yes, that's right. Well, it is here 2022 and um, uh, based on the photos that I've seen of it, it certainly looks uh, terrific. Uh, you can see just a few of the slides and we're going to talk about some of the photographs uh, featured here in the title slide. So it's been up for just a couple of weeks. What kind of feedback have you heard either from staff or visitors, maybe indirectly? Um, people are really excited about it. It's, you know, sports, of course, is it's pretty universally, uh, you know, subject that's pretty, there's universal interest in and, and it's fun and they're wonderful artifacts. And um, so the, the reception's just been really powerful positive excuse me i think there's something there for everyone even even people who may not be you know rabid sports fans they'll be fascinated by the history and the importance of sports to our history here is the entry to the exhibit at the national archives museum in washington um, the exhibit as we can see or the the gallery uh, above the doorway the lawrence f o'brien gallery Mm -hmm. And I'm sure some sports fans are going to recognize that name. Lawrence O'Brien was the longtime commissioner of the National Basketball Association, but he also had very important ties to the world of politics and government. Tell us about that. Um, he was an advisor to John F. Kennedy. Um, and in fact, we have a baseball that John F. Kennedy gave to him. It was one that 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 JFK had thrown out a ceremonial first pitch on opening day um, and, and signed and gave to him. But he, um, he, his family endowed this exhibition space, which is our temporary exhibition space. And his son is, is on our foundation board, the National Archives Foundation. Very good. How large is the gallery? How many different rooms are included? The gallery is one large space. It's about, well, relatively large, 3,000 square feet. And for each exhibit, we build temporary walls to divide the space into to different sections. The length of this exhibit, which is a little bit more than a year, I guess close to a year and a half, is that a typical length for a temporary exhibit at the archives? Yeah, it's about 15 months, and that is a, a pretty typical length. One thing I was curious about, and I asked you about this earlier, the uh, image on the right side of the screen, it is a presidential image. Tell us more about it, though. That is an image of President Truman. He's also engaged in throwing out a ceremonial first pitch, and that is a tradition that goes all the way back to President William Howard Taft. Uh, I believe it was in 1910. So for over 100 years, uh, almost every president since Taft has thrown out a ceremonial pitch on opening day. And there's a slideshow that shows that um, a series of presidents doing that. And it's a lot of fun. Okay. I also want to mention that the National Archives Museum is free. It's open to the public every day except Thanksgiving Day and Christmas Day. So I do hope people will make the trip to DC to see this exhibit and, and our other exhibitions. You know, we do a program here, Alice, in our bullpen theater about presidents in the pastime. Mm -hmm. And almost every American president has some kind of a direct or indirect connection to the game. And this tradition of throwing out first pitches, which is now more than a century long, you could almost do an exhibit entirely on presidential first pitches. There have been so many. Yes, and there are just such wonderful photos of them, too. And I love I love seeing the photos and you know, how they evolve, how people in the stands changed over the years. And yeah, it's a great subject. 
let's look at some of the specific artifacts, photos, documents included here. And we're going to start with a man who, for a long time, people associated with baseball, not as much anymore. For years here at the Hall of Fame, we've been trying to explain to people that uh, Civil War General Abner Doubleday really did not invent the game and really had little tangible connection to the national pastime. But you very interestingly have uncovered at least one connection between Doubleday and the game. Tell us about the letter, which we see on the right side of your screen. And I believe it was written shortly after the Civil War. Yes, that's correct. Um, as I understand it, it's the only written documentation that connects uh, um, General Doubleday to baseball uh, that historians have found. And this is a letter that he wrote while he was commanding a unit of Buffalo soldiers uh, at Fort McCabot in Texas. And he wrote this in 1871. And in it, he requests baseball equipment for the entertainment of his men. That's very interesting. Now, he was a very significant uh, general in the Civil War. Books have actually been written about his military career, even though we now know that there's really not, in terms of baseball, much to speak about with regard to Doubleday. Now, when he wrote this letter, he was uh, essentially on the Western Front all the way out in Texas. Yes, that's right. It was during the Indian Wars when, uh, after the Civil War, a lot of, of army units were posted to protect uh, settlers and people building railroads and involved in other projects in the West from Indian attacks. So these um, these forts were, you know, for the men, it was a, a there was a lot of downtime, you know, the, there were, you know, many days in between attacks, which they never knew when they were coming, but so they had a lot of time to fill and apparently baseball was the preferred pastime. It was, it was the favorite activity. Alice, I'm not sure how much we can read into the letter, but the mm -hmm. fact that he took the time to write a letter requesting baseball equipment, it does show that he had some affinity for the game. I believe so. Yes. And clearly he thought that this was a, you know, a wholesome way for the soldiers to spend their time. Yeah. Oh, it's a fascinating piece. A nice way to start our program. We're going to stay with a military theme here. We're going to advance uh, to the very early days of the 20th century. So what we have here is a poster for a military game. We have Fort Harrison against Fort Missoula. And I, was this Montana, I believe? With this yes, place? that's correct. So these two uh, units are getting ready to participate in a game. And it's a serious enough deal that they actually put up a poster advertising it. I find that fascinating. Yeah, I do too. And I just, I love the poster. I love the illustration. It's actually quite large. Um, but this was also on the Western frontier. So these were the, the same types of units posted um, during uh, this, this was, you know, near the end of, of, of the Indian Wars, I believe, but, um, but baseball, as you can see, was still very popular, and Fort Missoula is interesting in that it was a, um, it, it was a place where people crossed rank and racial lines to play together on the baseball team, um, and that was not something that, that happened much at that time at all. Um, so they played, of course, people from other forts like this poster is, you know, this is an example of that, but they also would play local semi professional teams. Um, uh, you know, it sounds like probably anybody who who they could play. Yeah. So they did have black and white players on the same team. Yes, and they had officers and um, soldiers playing which was was also unusual. Yeah, that might have created some interesting situations, uh, officers yeah. and soldiers <laughs> mingling in a, in a close athletic way. I, I, yeah, I'm sure it did. But one it's one of those I examples really of the like power of sports to bring people together. Absolutely. I really like the color here. I, you know, mm. I'm somewhat colorblind and mm -hmm. I, I really don't know what color it is. Maybe you can help me on that. It's kind of a kind of a it's I believe in in real life it's a little bit darker than it appears on the screen here but it's kind of a rusty orange color. Yeah. Um yeah, I believe that 
it's the color of the paper that it's printed on. It looks like it's really nicely done. It's got like a border or a frame around mm -hmm. it, kind of ornate. Mm -hmm. Uh, looks very professional, and there's the sketches of the players. Yeah, so yeah, look pretty professional too. It's, it's they impressive. do, and I, I, I think that they, you know, it shows that that people would come to these games and and watch them. It was a definitely a spectator sport. Now, a number of the artifacts and documents that you're using in this exhibit come from the archives museum itself. Uh, here we have one of the items, though, that is on loan from a place called the Baseball Hall of Fame. So we were able to lend this to you. And it's a fascinating object. 1918, the baseball season came to a premature end. It was not because of the flu pandemic, but it was because of World War I. So they ended the regular season early. They played the World Series early. Uh, this ball coming from the Hall of Fame collection, part of your exhibit now, and it was the last baseball hit in the last regular season game, 1918. Pick it up from there, if you will, Alice. Yeah, so um, the, for the World War I started in, in, well, the United States became involved in 1917, but uh, Major League Baseball continued to play games. They didn't alter their season right away. Um, and they came under a great deal of criticism for that from the public. The public felt like these able-bodied men should be fighting in the war, they should do their part um, like other Americans. So um, the Secretary of War issued what, what's known as the work or fight order in 1918, which meant that all able-bodied men either had to be fighting or as you know, the order <laughs> kind of clearly expresses or working in a war-related industry. And it, initially didn't apply to baseball players, but after more public outcry, um, the Secretary of War said, yes, you got you guys have to, to do your share too. So that led to this shortened season that you were talking about. Um, and after that, players had to either sign, had to enlist in the war or they had to go and work in a war related industry. And some players like Babe Ruth um, were able to work in what or to get jobs in factories which had baseball teams and this became um, kind of sarcastically referred to as the safe shelter league so they were able to continue playing baseball um, but for for factories so that was their their work um, the way that they, they dealt with the, the work part of the worker fight order you know it's interesting alice that there was this sentiment against the players playing the game that the the priority mm -hmm. was that they should be serving in the military during world war one and then you contrast that we're going to talk about it later with fdr world war ii where he gave the commissioner of baseball permission to keep the game going and then if you go back more recently to the pandemic a couple of years ago there were a lot of people pushing for baseball to be played to resume during the pandemic um, you know, and it did get started in July of that year, three or four months after much of the uh, nation was cut down. So it's kind of interesting how uh, some of these uh, public attitudes regarding baseball players playing under emergency circumstances kind of changed over time. That's right. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, the way that the, the, the two wars were um, kind of sold in a way to the to the American people by the government was very different between World War One and World War Two. World War One was very much about service. It's everyone's duty to sacrifice for the war. And in World War Two, you can see this change in the propaganda posters um, was very much those posters were very much influenced by the the advertising um, industry, which was fairly new at the time. So they, they emphasized much more the sort of idea that, you know, there are going to be certain benefits for you for helping us win the war and, you know, and also trying to make it look fun and, 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 you know, almost glamorous in a way sometimes. Getting back to the game, which this ball is connected to, again, it was the last regular season game. It was played at Navin Field, the home of the Detroit Tigers. They were hosting the Chicago White Sox. I love the fact that the last ball was caught by Davy Jones, which always makes me think of the lead singer of the Monkees, but uh, 
obviously no relation there. So this ended the regular season officially, but then we still had the World Series that had to be played. Right. And you were telling me the other day that the World Series in 1918 really didn't help the pandemic. It really <laughs> ended up spreading the flu that was already running rampant. That's right. They they believe that it was the 1918 World Series uh, in Boston and all the rallies and parades and other events around it, along with the games, that became a super spreader event that was responsible for the second deadly wave of the pandemic yeah. in the, that next fall. You mentioned a moment ago Babe Ruth, and that leads us into this next artifact, another fascinating yes. item. So here we have Babe Ruth's draft card, also from 1918. So during World War I, many major league players were exposed to the military draft. Babe Ruth, who at the time, well-known pitcher with the Boston Red Sox, he was not excluded from that. So here we have his official draft registration card. What's the information that you think is most pertinent, Alice, that we can glean from this card? Well, probably the most pertinent to Babe Ruth was line 10, where it indicates that he was married. And at the time, married men were not required to serve. So that enabled him to uh, avoid going into service and, and fighting. You know, interestingly, I was traveling on Monday with my son to look at colleges and we passed Bethlehem Steel. Um, in Pennsylvania, I had never seen this building before, but that's where Babe Ruth played in his in his uh, in his in, that was the league that he played in for that factory. It's quite an amazing looking building. Is the factory still active? No, it's been turned into an art center, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah, but it's just this giant rusty um, system of tubes, and uh, it, it's quite a sight. I, Kind of like to go back and photograph it. Yeah, but apparently the interior has been renovated to the point where they can feature exhibits. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I think do they have, have any sense of whether Babe Ruth actually had to do work in the factory, or was it mostly just playing ball? My sense is it was a pretty cushy, cushy yeah. position. It was mostly playing ball. Right. Very interesting. Um, we had talked a little bit about um, the numbers on the registration card there's kind of a long serial number in the upper left hand corner mm -hmm. but then on the right side we see number 28 and then we also see 28 highlighted in some kind of a, a blue marker do, do we know were you able to figure out what those numbers represented unfortunately i haven't been able to yet um i i'm gonna keep after that though and i'll i will let you know okay. so that you can share that with your busy viewers one other interesting note, if you look at the bottom, uh, it appears he does sign it George Ruth, not Babe. So he had to uh, he had to make it official with his first name, but uh, a fascinating document that I had never seen before you sent it to me uh, just about a week ago, Babe Ruth's draft card, 1918. All right, staying with the issue of the war, but jumping ahead to the Second World War, another really interesting piece here. So this is the famous letter that Commissioner Landis sent to President Roosevelt in 1942, asking FDR whether baseball should continue during World War II. Now, this is not the green light letter. The green light letter was FDR's response. This is the initial letter. I guess some have called it or nicknamed it the red light letter, um, but a very interesting letter. The first thing that jumps out at me it's handwritten by Landis. It's not typed. FDR's response was typewritten. Kind of jumps out at you that it's handwritten, right? It does. And my favorite documents are always the handwritten ones because you can kind of read more into the to the mood and, and uh, situation of the person writing in. What do you think was Landis's primary motivation in writing this letter? What was he trying to find out from the president what kind of a response message was he looking for? I think that he was very concerned about the negative press that Major League Baseball got during World War I. 
um, and wanted to kind of walk a careful line um, with the president, um, you know, and not, he, I'm sure he wanted to, to appear patriotic and in support of the war, but also as the commissioner of baseball, I'm sure he was very interested in, in allowing it to continue in some way. You really think he was trying to have the president take him, the commissioner, off the hook? People are getting on my case about baseball, whether we should continue or not. I'd like the decision to be made from a higher source. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, if the president says it's OK to continue baseball, that does that. And, and in fact, as you're, you, you know, and probably a lot of your viewers know, uh, President Roosevelt did say that baseball should continue and that that the, the American people needed that kind of re release from all the stresses and strains that the war occasioned. Um, so, uh, um, uh, of course, that that and he, he made it seem almost patriotic to continue yeah. baseball in service of the war effort. Of course, we've both seen, and I know many of our viewers have seen the green light letter, which was FDR's response. He never came out and made it like a direct order and said, you've got to do this. When you read between the lines, I think he made it pretty clear that, yeah, keeping baseball going is the way to go. He did. And he did also, of course, say that able-bodied players should should serve, um, but that that other players who were not eligible for service should continue to help the American people kind of forget their troubles. Alice, what about the photograph on the left? It's a ceremonial first pitch. Yes. Uh, looks like Washington against New York. Uh, what year would that be from? Oh, gosh. Um, I honestly, I'm sorry, I don't remember what year that one's from. I think it's early 40s. Yeah. Now, interesting that he is, he is standing up. Um, we know in his later years that he was in a wheelchair. Uh, so mm -hmm. he was at this point healthy enough that he could actually stand up and get that right arm high in the air and throw that ceremonial first pitch. That's right, yes. Yeah. But uh, really interesting correspondence between uh, Landis and the commissioner. Uh, we had talked a little bit about uh, the fact that these two gentlemen really didn't care for each other all that much, but they were able to put any of that animosity aside. You certainly don't sense the animosity in the letters, at least not that what I've read. Uh, so they were able to work together and find a solution, even though they came from different sides of the political spectrum. It's my understanding that this is kind of the culmination of a campaign. I guess other people had been had been campaigning with the president, like um, Mr. Wrigley, for example, um, to allow baseball to continue. So he, Mr. Landis, may have had a sense that he was going to get a positive response. We're going to jump back in time. We're going to go back from 1942 to 1925 to talk about this next document. And, and this is as fascinating as any of the materials that you've shared with us. So what we have here, this is Rube Foster's letter. Rube Foster, by this point, has started the Negro National League. He has started what we now consider the Negro Leagues. Uh, he'd been a prominent uh, player, manager, then became owner of the Chicago American Giants, and as the Giants owner, also became the founder of Negro Leagues Baseball. And what Foster is trying to do here, he's sending a letter to a local parole board, part of his effort to acquire a player, a player named Roy Tyler. Roy Tyler was playing for the Kansas City Monarchs, another Negro Leagues team, but he was on parole and in order for Foster to acquire Tyler in a transaction and essentially kind of take him under his wing and I guess be his protector or overlooker, if you will, he had to have permission from the parole board to do this. So this is Foster making his argument, I guess, that, um, yeah, I need this man and he's, he's okay to, uh, to work for my team. Yeah, this was part of a, a really fascinating prison to professional baseball pipeline that developed at Fort Leavenworth, I'm sorry, at Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. 
And the reason that we have these records is because it's a, it's a federal um, institution. And, and of course, we have all the, the records of the federal government. So we have this fascinating um, uh, a document where Roy Tyler is signing up to be what was called at the time the first friend, which really just means a, a parole uh, advisor or supervisor. And Roy Tyler was one of, uh, there were, I believe, three other men who played baseball at Leavenworth and developed, you know, professional level skills. Um, uh, they played for a team called the Booker Tees. Um, and Leavenworth Prison was segregated at the time, so there was also a white team that they played against, and they uh, almost always beat the white team. It's interesting that the letter turned out to be successful because not only did Tyler end up playing for the Chicago franchise uh, in 25, but he also played in 26 and 33. So he did play parts of three seasons. Uh, so Foster was convincing. What were the original charges that Tyler had faced? He was charged with mutiny from the uh, 1917 Houston riot. Uh, he was in, in a um, military unit that was a, a black military unit that was stationed in Houston that was harassed by the public and the police there. Um, and they, at the time, believed that one of their men had been murdered by a, a police officer. And they took to the streets and several people were, were killed. Um, and several men were hanged uh, after the court martial, after the trial. Um, and, and this was quite a devastating incident uh, for the country. Do we know if Tyler had direct involvement or did he just get caught wrong place, wrong time? We don't know, but they uh, court martialed I believe it was like 64 men. Um, a, a, so a huge number of men were swept up in these trials and they were all tried together as a group. They had one um, military officer who was uh, representing them, but he wasn't a lawyer. Um, and so the, the trial and especially the, the hanging, the execution of, of the men involved in this came under a great deal of criticism. And uh, later he, he was originally sentenced to life um, but that was commuted to a sentence of 20 years with possibility of parole at seven. Um, so that is how he was able to leave to play professional baseball. While no one would defend murder, do you think we can safely say that this might have been an overreaction to punish these men? It certainly appears that way. I believe there there were, you know, a, a fewer than um, I think it was around 11 people died in the in the riot. Um, so it's unlikely that all 64 men uh, committed murder, yeah. obviously. You know, Leavenworth is is always kind of an interesting topic. You, you watch old television shows and old movies and you hear people joke and say, you know, you know if you don't be behave, we're gonna send you off to Leavenworth. <laughs> How bad was Leavenworth? I, I'm afraid I can't comment on that, um, but I, I do know that that baseball was considered a, a way to give the, the prisoners an outlet um, and, a, and a healthy, you know, exercise, uh, you know, um, opportunity to exercise. Um, so I, I think that was part of an attempt at some reforms. And you do think this was fairly common with Negro League teams trying to get players through parole boards. This was not an isolated situation. I don't believe it was common. I think that, you know, these four, there were four men, I believe, who went from Leavenworth to, to professional baseball, but I don't believe there were, there were, I'm not aware of any others. Oh, okay. Very interesting story. And uh, one that I had, I had never heard of. We, we teach about the Negro Leagues here at the Hall of Fame in our exhibits and our educational units. And uh, this was one aspect of the story completely new to me, so uh, really fascinating stuff. Um, here we have um, very interesting artwork. Uh, this is America. Keep it free. This is essentially a propaganda poster 
that was put out by the Office of War Information in 1942. What was the purpose of the poster? What were they trying to do? This is one of a series of posters that was created by a, a private poster company for the Office of War Information to be hung in factories. And the purpose of the series was to inspire the workers who were helping to produce um, munitions and, and you know, ships and other things for the, the war effort to inspire them to work hard, um, and they were doing it through this, you know, these ideals of America and, and appealing to their patriotism and also a vision of, a, you know, kind of an ideal life that they can go back to after the war is over. And so fascinating that they used baseball um, and that they that they used actually this is a, a photograph that a photographer named Dorothea Lang took uh, during the Great Depression. Um, and they colorized the image and, and kind of pepped it up for the poster series. Um, but I think, you know, baseball really speaks to some of America's fondest ideals, you know, that idea that we, anyone can, can uh, you know, make the big leagues. If you have the talent and you put in the work, anybody can make it in this country. Um, so uh, I, I find this a really interesting poster. It is propaganda, but my sense is it was probably pretty effective. Yeah, I, I, I could see that. I could definitely see that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I believe it was. Yeah. And just to clarify, this is not meant, this poster was not meant to recruit soldiers. Right. It was really meant to motivate the factory workers to tell them, hey, you're important to the war effort. We need you to really put in an effort, not go through the motions. What you're doing is really important as part of the war effort. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, Dorothy Lang, we're gonna talk a little bit more about her in a moment, very famous photographer, probably best known for her, her depression uh, era imagery. Uh, she came up with a number of photos that remain iconic to this day, but was still creating um, this kind of photographic art, if you will, in the 1940s, um, though this one, as you mentioned, was altered probably without her permission. Um, but we talk about one of the great photographers in American history, certainly Dorothea Lange uh, has to be included on that list. Here we have another uh, wartime, um, well, actually not a wartime uh, related issue, uh, but an issue that sort of ties into the whole relationship between Japanese Americans and baseball. Uh, this was something that would come up repeatedly, uh, 1920s, 1930s, certainly in the 1940s when the Japanese incarceration camps were begun. So this photo, which is actually part of the Hall of Fame collection, is from a barnstorming game, 1927 in Fresno, California. And that is where this Japanese American, Kenichi Zenimura, uh, lived. He was a player, but also a promoter, an organizer of the game. Uh, he was somebody that actually organized a league of Japanese American players in Fresno. And apparently his teams were so famous, both nationally and internationally, that when Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth arrive in Fresno with their bar barnstorming teams, they actually asked Zenimura to take part in the game along with these three other Japanese Americans. Fascinating. Yes, and Zenimura, who is, who is the man standing between Gehrig and Ruth in this photograph, is a really fascinating character. And um, we'll learn more about him when we, we talk about the Japanese baseball at the Japanese internment camps. But like um, Black Americans, Japanese Americans could not play baseball on the in the major league on the major league team, so they had their own leagues in the West Coast. Obviously, Ruth and Garrick thought enough of him and these other guys to include him. Granted, it's an exhibition game; maybe they're not going all out, mm -hmm. but you know they don't want to just have guys who can't play. These guys have to have some serious ball playing ability. I guess what jumps out at you about the photograph is how short Zenimore is yes. compared to Garrick and Ruth. Of course, they were, you know, they were above average sized men for that era. Mm -hmm. um, but here is this little guy, and he was a terrific player. 
That's my understanding. Yeah, that a lot of these guys were were great great players. Yeah. The uh, the names of the barnstorming teams are are kind of amusing. Ruth's team was called the Bustin Babes, and Lou Gehrig's team, uh, which barnstormed in the winter as well, was called the Larapin Lou's. I've never been able to figure out what the word Larapin means. Maybe one yeah. day uh, we'll figure that out. Um, but uh, they did play in this uh, exhibition game uh, in Fresno, California. Uh, and I was doing a little bit of research, Alice, about Zenomura. You know, he is mm -hmm. still a legendary figure in Japan mm -hmm. uh, and among Japanese Americans. Books have been written about him. Uh, this, this is somebody that, in terms of the Asian community, really almost a godlike figure. Mm. All right, we're going to stay with the subject of Japanese American players, but now we're going to move to the World War II years and the incarceration centers or camps. So here is a very striking photo. This is a baseball game that was played in 1942 at Manzanar, California. Uh, was what was called an incarceration center. Sometimes we hear the, the word internment. I guess internment maybe makes it sound a little more palatable. Incarceration sounds maybe more accurate, certainly a, a tougher word. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about what we see here and how popular these games were. So um, during World War II, after the, um, after the attacks on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, uh, there was great concern about uh, citizens of and residents of Japanese descent in the United States and concerned that they would be disloyal. Um, so uh, President Roosevelt uh, ordered uh, 110,000 um, Japanese Americans and residents of, of Japanese descent into these what were known at the time as internment camps. And you're right that that was a term that I think made it sound Pal more more palatable, but it is more accurate to, to call them incarceration centers um, because they were forcibly removed and sent to I believe there were ten of them in the in the western part of the United States. Man, this one is Manzanar. Um, Manzanar, California, is near Death Valley. Um, a lot of these camps were in desert areas, kind of pretty pretty desolate. Um, they were surrounded by barbed wire and, and guarded by our armed guards. Um, but baseball was a very popular way to not only pass the time in these camps, but as one Japanese American described it, it was a way to wrap yourself in the American flag, um, to pro proclaim uh, the, the people, the Japanese proclaim their loyalty to the United States and their identity as Americans through the game. Um, Dorothy Leng, the photographer we've been talking about, took this photo. She um, worked for what was called the War Relocation Authority, um, whose records we have at the National Archives, and documented camps, um, uh, and but also took very detailed notes that and and captioned the photos with a great deal of information. And the caption for this photo explains that this is one of 80 teams that were formed just at Manzanar. Manzanar held about 10,000 people. Um, so it's a huge, huge camp, um, but 80, 80 teams were, were formed there. So this was you know, fun for the players. Um, clearly it was a, also a big spectator uh, sport. Lots of people came to watch the games. Uh, and um, um, so very popular form of entertainment at the camps. So the, the, the Japanese prisoners, if you will, participated in these games. Um, and then we see a number of fans come out. Who's comprising the fan base? Is that just other prisoners? Other prisoners, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. You know, you can see why Lang was such a great photographer. Just the layout here, you know, you see a mm -hmm. fairly large crowd of fans to watch obviously a, a non-professional game, an exhibition game, but then set against the backdrop, those tiny little houses where these yes. folks had to live. And mm -hmm. then the huge mountain, which almost serves as a barrier to this mm -hmm. game. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all there. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's just a, uh, an incredibly powerful uh, photograph um, and amazing. How, how many teams did you say were at Manzanar? 
80. She, she, she noted there are over 80 teams formed there. Wow. It's amazing. And you can, see, just... you can see these photos and, and hundreds of others uh, on our um, website, the National Archives. Very good. Women also played in these games. Uh, here we have a team known as the Chickadee Softball Team. And this also uh, took place at uh, Manzanar. Um, hard to see if there's much of a crowd because we can only you know, see a very kind of tight angle behind the plate. It looks like the ladies watching the game are having a good time. And I guess even the, the two ladies playing are, are enjoying it as well. Uh, but women had this activity that, um, uh, that they enjoyed also. Clearly, yes. And I, 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 um, I suspect that this photograph was posed to some degree, but I think those smiles are genuine. Interesting. So both men and women uh, among these Japanese prisoners participating in these games, uh, they did provide recreation, but as you said a moment ago, they did show patriotism. There's no more patriotic or uh, baseball-centric game or uh, American-centric game than baseball. And mm -hmm. if you play baseball, uh, maybe a sign that you do love the country as well. Now that brings us into uh, something else that went on during the World War II era, but also into the 1950s. Uh, and you have as part of this exhibit, some really wonderful film uh, mm -hmm. that was shot in the 1950s. So here we have all American baseball league game that was being played in Alexandria, Virginia. We're gonna show you this video. It's a couple of minutes long. It's gonna start out with silent footage and then there's going to be a narrator who makes some rather interesting comments. I'll put it that way. We'll talk about those comments on the other side. So again, this is silent footage from the All-American League, early 1950s. Not a huge crowd, but a few fans there. And this is actually, this first clip is from the uh, early 1930s. It's a um, semi-professional league in Oakland, California. This time, baseball brings out the All-American Journal Baseball League for spring training at Alexandria, Virginia. Two teams are working out, the Fort Wayne Daisies and the Racine Bells, getting in shape for an opening day doubleheader. Dottie Schroeder is quite confident that her hair won't get in her eyes. And keeping her eye on the ball is catcher Kate Fondro. Okay, gals, play ball. Matt Scott has quite a curve, but this one is wide. Gene Marlowe is willing to wait. Gene punts it, the squeeze is on. Tibby Eisen slides home with a run and a nicely bruised leg. Better a bruise than long pants, eh, gals? Joe Weaver hits the long ball, almost out of the ballpark. Boy, that clears the base paths. And inside the park, Homer, by a whisker. I imagine, Alice, if some of the players heard that narration, especially the <laughs> remark, about better a bruise, gals, than uh, long pants. They would have yeah. wanted to slap him. Yeah, pretty um, cringy. Yeah, because we know those players, for the most part, did not like wearing skirted uniforms. Yeah. Many of them put up a, a mild protest, but they were basically mm -hmm. told they had no choice. Mm -hmm. They tried to improvise with sliding pads and things like that. Mm -hmm. so that was certainly a point of contention. They did not like skirted uniforms at all. Yeah. Well understandable and it, it it you know in doing research for this exhibit i i was really kind of shocked at how uh deeply held beliefs about the inappropriateness of sports for women how long those persisted and how strong they were i think there's still some of that today yeah you know we don't see a lot of footage of women playing baseball in the 1930s or women playing in the old american league we see a lot of still photographs, but seeing the footage of them playing, um, that really kind of strikes me. I, I haven't seen a lot of that 
and uh, it does it does give you an image. I don't know how accurate. I think some of that action that we saw was probably staged, and certainly the the announcer is a bit of a distraction with his comments, but at least does give us a little bit of a taste of what women's baseball looked like. So again, this uh, from the motion picture archives. And actually, well, we don't want to repeat that, so we're going to jump ahead here. Uh, but great footage, and um, folks can see that in the exhibit, right? They can watch the video. Alice, I think your microphone has been muted. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Thank you. Sorry, I um, there's a lawnmower, and <laughs> so I muted myself, and it wouldn't let me unmute. Sorry. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry, Bruce. What was your question? You know, I, I think it's I think it's interesting to be able to see, um, you know, some of this footage. Oh, yes. Um, that uh, we don't often get an opportunity to see, you know, mm -hmm. most of our imagery of the All-American League is through still photographs and maybe the movie A League of Their Own, which is great. It's a terrific movie. It's, it's mm -hmm. funny. It's dramatic. It's, it's accurate in many ways but still a movie and, and to get to see what these players look like, even though some of it's staged, mm -hmm. it does give us a taste of what women's baseball looked like back in the forties and fifties. Yeah. And you certainly can see the, the athleticism, um, you know, they were, they were clearly athletes and they were, they were playing hard. We're going to stay in the era of the 1940s with this next document. It's a relatively long letter that was written by Jackie Robinson, and it's regarding that infamous military bus incident, which took place in 1942. Here's the background. Robinson was arrested and charged with a crime after an incident on a military bus. He was a lieutenant in the U.S. Army at the time. My understanding was that he was wearing his lieutenant uniform. Uh, he sat toward the front of the bus. The driver of the bus said, no, you're black. You have to sit in the back of the bus. Robinson argued with him rightly and said, well, I'm a lieutenant in the Army. I should be able to sit wherever there's an empty seat. This led to a, an argument. Uh, I don't believe it was a physical confrontation, but it was a verbal confrontation between the two. Robinson ends up getting charged with a crime. So shortly after that happens, he ends up writing this letter. Tell us who he wrote it to and what he was trying to find out in writing this um, in this letter. Yeah, so so uh, Robinson, Lieutenant Robinson was charged with insubordination and I think conduct on becoming an officer. Um, and he's writing to a man named Truman K. Gibson, who was an assistant to the Secretary of War. Um, he's someone that he had uh, had interactions with in the past. He knew he knew this man, but he's basically asking him for advice about the instant incident. He's wondering if he should go to the NAACP and the black press to publicize it. This is in between the incident and the trial. And he's wondering if I think he's wondering if some of um, press are negative press against the, the military basically would help him in the uh, in the trial. Um, and uh, Gibson wrote back and I believe advised him, him not to go to the press, but to keep him apprised of what happens. Um, and his Gibson wrote the the handwritten annotations that you can see in the, 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 the first page of the letter. He, he noted that Robinson was, he was quite well known for playing football at the time. This is before his baseball career, obviously. Um, but he's saying, you know, this is a well-known athlete. Um, we should really watch watch this. So Gibson had a sense this was a pretty important situation developing. Yes, absolutely. It's interesting that the letter is written on a hospital letterhead. Right. Klosky General Hospital in yes. Temple, Texas. Why was Robinson in the hospital at the time? He was being treated for a football injury. Actually, it's, it, it, um, something had happened to his ankle. Uh, so he was actually coming from, from the hospital when and returning to the base when the incident on the bus occurred. Robinson didn't necessarily get the response that he was looking for, the help that he was looking for. But the story does essentially have a happy ending. Robinson is court-martialed. It goes to 
military tribunal and he's found not guilty on all the charges. And we believe this is an incident that Branch Rickey knew about, may have factored into his decision to essentially select Robinson as the first player to break the color barrier by 1947. This is one of two different Jackie Robinson letters included in the exhibit. The second one is much later. Again, this first one is from the 1940s. This is from 1960. And by this time, Robinson has retired as a player. He's now an executive with the Chock Full of Nuts Coffee Company in New York City. And he is writing to Richard Nixon, who at the time was vice president of the United States. And at the time, these two men were basically friends and allies, correct? Yes, uh, Robinson supported uh, Nixon in his in his campaign for president. In this letter, Robinson isn't really complaining about Nixon, but he's complaining about his um, presidential partner, if you will, Dwight Eisenhower. What's the gist of the complaint? Well, Robinson uh, is wondering if, you know, Nixon has said that he is going to carry on with uh, Eisenhower's policies and agenda. And so uh, basically, Robinson is asking him, does that include civil rights? Because Eisenhower was uh, admonishing American people, you know, black Americans to be patient, to, you know, to um, not try to rush change. And this was deeply frustrating for, for Jackie Robinson. I'm guessing that Nixon's response to the letter was perhaps not what Jackie wanted to hear, may have been the start of a bit of a falling out between them. I don't know if the falling out started here, um, but it certainly was a falling out. Jackie Robinson became frustrated with with Nixon's positions on civil rights, but also changed his his view on uh, on, on President Kennedy. Um, through some interactions that he had with him. Robinson did support Nixon during his initial presidential run, but not during his second run, correct? That's right. Yeah. So very interesting uh, direct correspondence between uh, Jackie Robinson and uh, President Nixon or Vice President Nixon at the time. You know, this is the kind of correspondence that uh, I'm almost afraid we'll lose in future years because so much of what is sent today is email and then it's deleted and we don't necessarily have hard copies of it. Yeah. Uh, but thankfully, we do have hard copies from the 40s, 50s and 60s. Yes. Uh, and then, as I said, you know, um, the handwritten letters or letters like this one that have handwritten annotations, I think, provide you a much better kind of view and window into the past and what was happening. So I agree. I think that will be a, a loss. The annotations that are uh, on the side and the top of the letter, mm -hmm. do we know if those were written by Robinson or someone else? Those, I suspect, were written by someone working with President Nixon, um, probably taking notes as he's, as he's talking about how to respond yeah. to this letter. Alice, one final slide that I want to talk about, and it's yes. uh, chronologically uh, the most recent item of everything we've discussed. It's um, now 21 years ago, 2001 World Series, only weeks after September 11th. A famous photograph, Joe Torre, Yankee manager on the left, Bob Brenly, Arizona Diamondbacks manager on the right. This is from the World Series, President George Bush in the middle. Um, as we know, President Bush threw out the ceremonial first pitch. It was prior to game three of that series. He threw pretty much a perfect strike, drew a raucous reaction from the crowd. You see this photograph, uh, Bush looking rather triumphant with his right hand or right arm elevated. What do you think this moment meant for America, especially coming so close after September 11th? Um, I, I think this was just a huge moment for the United States and, and maybe the first moment after the attacks of 9-11 when the country felt united um, against the forces that, that attacked us. Um, you know, as I was 
speaking about earlier, um, the, one of the powers of sports is is to make people feel united and, and part of a community. And President Bush showed great bravery in in coming to the to the stadium that day and throwing out the pitch. He's wearing a bulletproof vest underneath that New York Fire Department jacket that he's wearing, mm -hmm. which is in the exhibition, by the way. Um, and he was advised, you know, by many people not to do it, but he felt it was important. And uh, after he threw the pitch, the crowd burst into spontaneous chants of USA, USA, USA. And from what I understand from people who were there, um, and President Bush himself said it was one of the most powerful things he'd ever experienced. Is the jacket part of the permanent collection at the museum? It is. So all of the presidential libraries are part of the National Archives. And so this comes from the Bush Library and it's part of their permanent collection. Yeah. A lot of things we've talked about today are things that we don't remember firsthand. We're simply not old enough. Uh, but this is certainly we do, something we do remember. It doesn't seem like it was 21, 22 years ago. It seems a lot more mm -hmm. recent than that. Um, and it's perhaps even more powerful to now see it in terms of the photograph, but also in terms of the actual jacket, as you mentioned. Uh, it does have the NYFD logo uh, on it, along with uh, President Bush's name stenciled in it. Uh, very powerful image from that 2000 World Series. Um, setting aside the importance of the significance of this photograph, it was a great series too. The final result was not what I wanted. I'm a Yankee fan, but uh, it was a tremendous series. The Yankees had some remarkable comeback wins in uh, the games at Yankee Stadium. Uh, and then after a blowout in game six, game seven was a very tight fought uh, game that essentially went down to the final batter. Um, a very memorable World Series on so many different fronts. Uh, but you'll see that photograph and you can see the actual jacket that belonged to President Bush if you visit the museum archives. One of the things that we wanna do is encourage people to uh, take a look at uh, the website. And I think we may have lost uh, the link that I put up. We had, to, we had to go to our secondary program. So I wanna read out what that link is. And I'm gonna type it into the chat room as well. So it's museum.archives.gov, G-O-V, slash all dash American. So if you wanna visit the exhibit online, museum.archives.gov slash all American, and all American is uh, hyphenated as well. And I'm gonna put that into the chat so that people can take a, a look at that. Um, when folks go to the website, Alice, and take a look mm -hmm. at the exhibit, um, how much of what is actually on exhibit will they be able to see through photographs and imagery? That's a good question. Um, there are just a handful of photographs of the documents and artifacts on display, but there is an, an eight minute video tour where I take you through the exhibit so you can get a much better sense of the space and see more and learn more about the display items. Now, of course, what we really would like people to do is to visit the exhibit yes. and see it in person. There's nothing quite like doing that in person. And folks can do that as well. Uh, there is a site where people can get tickets. They don't have to purchase them. They're free of charge. It's recreation.gov, recreation.gov. And I'm going to type that in as well. And if you go to recreation.gov and you type in National Archives Museum, uh, it will take you to the area where you can reserve tickets ahead of time. And that's a great way to do that, just to make sure that you can get in at the time that you want, because I believe you're still doing time ticketing, correct? No, you can you can just show up, um, come to the door, um, but there are times when there are long lines, especially during you know holiday breaks and summertime. So we do advise you make a reservation in advance, especially during those busy times. But um, but you don't need a time ticket at this point. Yeah. 
All right, well, thanks for clarifying that. So again, that website, we put it in the chat room, is recreation.gov.gov. And then if you want to see the website, the exhibit online, museum.archives.gov slash all American. And again, all American is, uh, is hyphenated. Uh, and this is certainly something that we encourage you to do. The busy times, Alice, Saturdays and Sundays? Um, busy times are really, you know, the school breaks like Christmas break or spring break or, you know, the day after Thanksgiving and the weekend after Thanksgiving. And then much of the summer is very busy. Um, other than that, it, it, isn't, it isn't bad at all. Yeah. And as you said, you're open seven days a week. Yes. Uh, 362 days a year. Yes, um, 363, I think, just, just Christmas and Thanksgiving were closed. So you're open on New Year's. Uh, yep. You have us beat there. We're closed on New Year's. That's why I was thinking of 362. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is a terrific exhibit. I'm hoping to get down there. I've actually never been to Washington, believe it or not. Oh, please do come. Let's have Archive. you. Uh, so if, if I come down there, you'll, you'll let me in, right? I will let you in. I will take you on a tour myself. I would be delighted. Yeah. For those that want to see the exhibit in person, how much time should they give to really get a sense of what's included? In the exhibition or in yeah. the whole museum? <laughs> because of course you'll- The exhibition you'll want itself. Yeah. Um, the exhibition itself, um, you know, it depends on your attention span. An hour would be good. Two hours would be better. So one to two hours to give you a sense of the exhibit. And if you wanted mm -hmm. to go through uh, the rest of the museum, well, I guess you could be there for several days, right? <laughs> well, you could certainly days. spend the day there, but. Um... Yeah. Well, Alice, I want to thank you for uh, being with us over this past hour to talk about this exhibit uh, that you um, have created, All American, The Power of Sports, uh, just opened up in mid-September. We'll continue until January 7th of 2024. Um, keep us up to date on how things are going there. And um, I, I hope a lot of our viewers can go. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to go maybe sometime in uh, 2023. But uh, Alice, we really do appreciate your time. Thank you. Oh, Bruce, thank you so much for having me. It was, it was absolutely wonderful to share with everyone. Thank you. And you know, we're not done with the National Archives because next week, next Thursday, uh, we are going to, again, be featuring uh, the National Archives in a discussion about Roberto Clemente. Uh, that's a program that's going to be later in the day. It's going to be at 5 p.m. Eastern time. We are going to talk about Roberto Clemente with Hall of Famer Edgar Martinez and also with a gentleman named Rodney Slater. Uh, he was once Secretary of Transportation for President Bill Clinton and uh, is uh, now um, one of the uh, high-ranking executives at the National Archives. So Rodney Slater, Edgar Martinez will join us uh, next Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern uh, for that program. So we are not done uh, with this uh, wonderful museum world in Washington, D.C. Thank you again, Alice. Thank you for mm -hmm. all those folks uh, who have joined us today. We hope you've enjoyed the program along with all of our other programs. And if you visit our YouTube channel for the Hall of Fame, you can watch this program and all the other shows that we've done over the last couple of years. Thanks for being with us. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.